Welcome, great teens. We're going to do another lesson on wave sound and light. We are now going to look at longitudinal waves and sound. Previously, we had looked at transverse pulses. We looked at transverse waves. Okay, and there's a lot of things I'm going to remind you of about that. But today, we're going to look at another wave, which is longitudinal wave. First thing we need to do is let's talk about what I want you to be able to do by the end of this lesson. Okay, so let's think about the key concepts. In terms of longitudinal waves, you need to be able to give me a definition of what a longitudinal wave is. So the definition is going to be very important, but it's like everything else. Then you're going to have to give me important terminology, and by that we're talking about things like what is amplitude, wavelength, all of those things. And I'm sure you remember those from transverse waves. Then we're going to look at some calculations. It's a wave, which means it's going to have a wave speed, just like our transverse waves did. So we're going to need to do calculations. But what's the point of a longitudinal wave? Well, a very, very important longitudinal wave is sound. And in fact, we're very grateful that we have these longitudinal waves. Otherwise, you'd just be looking at a screen, and I would just be using my hands and looking silly, because you wouldn't be able to hear me. All right, so sound is really important. Within that, what do I need you to be able to do by the time we're finished today? Is we're going to look at certain things to do with sound. Things like the properties of sound. What makes sound special? What can we do with sound? Things like that it is a longitudinal wave. Okay? That it is a, that it can be reflected. It's got wonderful things that we can use it for. That comes, comes into the applications, but us as humans apply to a lot of things besides just being able to hear things. But animals are so clever when it comes to the use of sound. And then we're going to need to do some calculations, just like with the longitudinal waves. Okay, so we've got a lot to get through, and I'm hoping you're going to hang in there with me. We're gonna, I'm going to show you some interesting things, and hopefully he's going to actually enjoy sound. Sound is actually one of my favorite things to teach. I really enjoy it. Let's get on to what a longitudinal wave is, okay? Now, I'm hoping you remember from, a, from when we did transverse waves, and I'm just going to quickly draw this in, is with a transverse wave, we remember that we have a position of rest, and then on that position of rest, we get a transverse wave that does this, okay? And we remember this is like water waves and that sort of thing. And that with the transverse wave, our particles of our motion go up and down, the particles of whatever medium it's going through, but the wave goes sideways. Okay, and those mediums are things like string, air, um, water, all of that sort of stuff. So this was our nice transverse wave, which we did last time. Remember our amplitude was the distance from the bottom top of, um, top of a crest to a equilibrium position or the rest position, or it could have been to the bottom of a trough. We spoke about positions in phase where we have, for example, this position over here and this little x over here. Those are two points on my wave that are in phase because they're going to do exactly the same thing at the same time. And then that distance between them gives me the wavelength. Okay, so now we have a whole bunch of things that are important inside the transverse wave. But the biggest thing I wanted you to see is that it is the one where the particles move up and down, but the wave moves sideways. But what about a longitudinal wave? In the last lesson, we also looked at using the slinky spring, and I'm going to remind you what those are. It's these little things. Okay, and I have a nice, th this one actually is my favorite too because it's small. And this, when I do this with my slinky spring, spring, I'm actually creating a little bit of a longitudinal wave, okay, because of the way the particles are moving, because we're forcing them to come close together and then further apart and then close together and then further apart, close together. Remember, that doesn't happen when it's a transverse wave, it does this. We need to look at something a little more detailed for you. So what we're going to do is we're going to look at a quick video clip where we're actually going to show you a longitudinal wave moving with a slinky spring, okay? So I want you to watch 
We're going to show it as pulses. Okay, do you remember that when we first started transverse waves, we first looked at a transverse pulse. So we looked at the fact that we could make one at a time. That's what we're going to do here first. We're going to show you a longitudinal pulse, and then when there's a whole bunch of those, that becomes a longitudinal wave. So if you watch it, watch carefully, because the person creating the wave for us creates a pulse. They move their hand backwards and forwards, backwards and forwards. And if you look, watch carefully, and you can see that the wave, there's positions, like at the moment, if you look in the middle, you can see that there's a part where the, the particles are far apart, and then there's a little piece when they're close together. Okay, and if we carry on watching, it keeps doing that. The particles get close together, they get further apart. They get close together, they get further apart. That is a longitudinal wave. Because what we have is, and it's what I showed you just now, is that the particles go far apart and then they come close together. Go far apart and they come close together. And that's how the energy moves from one end to the other. Because this particle moves backwards and forwards, getting bigger and smaller all the time. That is our longitudinal wave. So if we go back and we look at the definition of a longitudinal wave, okay, and this is really, really important, it is a wave where the particles, the particles, in the medium, sound, water, whatever, move parallel to the direction of motion. I cannot say that they move in the same direction of motion because if you were watching carefully, you would have seen that they actually go backwards and forwards. But the pulse moves along the slinky. Okay, so the pulse moves in one direction, but the actual particles move backwards and forwards. Sometimes that's a little hard to see with the slinky. So we're going to go back and we're going to look at an at a animation which is going to show it really nicely. Now what I want you to do when you look at this animation is we have a very nice, we have a yellow dot on the animation. That yellow particle is the same as one part of the slinky. Okay? I want you to watch carefully how it moves because that's what we're really looking at. So if we look at the yellow dot. The little white particle comes along, transfers its energy to the yellow one, which then transfers its energy to the white one, and the yellow one moves backwards and forwards. So we're getting a, a, react, a situation where the, dot move, the, part, the pulse is moving towards the right as you're watching your screen, but our little particles are moving right and left, right and left. Now this is really slowed down, so it makes it easier for you to see, but they go right and left, right and left. That is really important for us because what I'm showing you is that there's a displacement and I'm hoping what you picked up as you were watching that is that the yellow particle doesn't just keep going on and on and on and on, on forever but it has a definite, it gets to a certain position then it stops then it comes back, goes to the other side and stops, comes back, goes to the other side then stops. What is it doing? It is having a maximum displacement. So if we now look at what we learned in transverse waves, where we had the concept of amplitude, which was the maximum displacement from the rest position, we get exactly the same here. It's just a little more difficult to see. So when we go back to the video, at the moment, the yellow particle is in its rest position. The dark lines down the center of the screen that you can see are the rest position. We let it play, okay, now it's displacing, and right there, that is its maximum displacement. The yellow particle is moved to the right, it is displaced. Then it's going to change direction, it goes back to rest, which is what we expected, we saw that with transverse waves, and then it moves to the maximum displacement in the opposite direction. So each of my particles has a maximum displacement from rest, and it goes through the cycle. So it goes one way, goes through rest, goes another way, through rest, goes the other way. Same with what we had with our transverse waves, when it would go up and down. It was just a bit easier to see, because you could see the motion. That's really important to us, because what we've now discovered is that a longitudinal wave has an amplitude. That's brilliant. but it can't have a crest or a trough because if you look, if we just look for a little while longer, you'll see that's just moving backwards and forwards so we don't have that nice up and down motion like we had in transverse wave. So how does that help us? Because 
we've got this amplitude, great, but amplitude for what? How do I know where a maximum is or a minimum is? How does this help me when I'm trying to look at the wave and look at what the wave is made out of? So let's look at what happens when we have lots of particles and it's going to be a little bit easier to see. We're still looking at an animation and now we're going to build in a couple of extra terms because we can't use crest and trough. So here we go. So we got, we're looking at the sound particles and now we've got a whole bunch and if you look at them, it's actually really nice. I'm hoping you can see this shows really nicely that we have a whole bunch of particles that get close together and some that get far apart. Now right there is a compression. That is a situation where we have the particles in my, my um, medium that are now close together. They are compressed. That is almost like thinking of a trough or a crest. Not quite, but it's a position in the wave. So we don't say it's a crest, we don't say it's equal to a trough, but it is a position where we have maximum squishedness. That's a good word for this. The particles are compressed. They are squished together as far as they're going to go while the wave moves. Okay, so they're as close together as they're going to get. They've been compressed. Then we have another position. So if we watch again, the particles are going to move. Okay, in a second, because the compression has still been shown. And over there, we have a rare refraction. Now, this is a strange term. And you would think, well, what's the opposite of a compression? It's definitely not a rare fraction, but that's what the term is. And what that means is, is that now the particles are far apart. They've been stretched. Okay, now they're as far as they're going to go. This also represents a place of maximum displacement. But it's not a trough or a crest either. It's just a position where we can see that the particles are either close together or the particles are far apart. Okay, so we get our compression and we get our rare refraction. That's really important. So if we watch for a little longer, you'll see that we will always have a rare refraction and on, next to it is a compression. And if you actually look closely to the screen, you get the fact that we have the rare refraction, compression, rare refraction, compression, rare refraction. Always happens like that. Okay, but let's define those terms because those are great, but, you know, what do we do with them? Well... If we go back and we're going to look at some of the important terms. First of all, the compression. It's a region where the particles, let's do that, are closest together. Now, this can be a little difficult to draw. If you're like me, you're not an artist, and drawing little slinky springs and stuff is just really difficult, and we don't do that because, you know, it's just embarrassing, especially on national television. So when we represent our wave, we do this. We draw it with lines, and our compression is the position, which I'm drawing now, where we have our lines close together. This represents a wave, all these little lines together, and then they come back together, and we get a compression. They don't go skew, but that's OK. So what that means is, over here, that's a compression. Particles are close together. Okay, every longitudinal wave has to go through that process. What about the rare refraction that we spoke about? Well, when we define that, it's when they're furthest apart. It's the position where we move them away. Okay, that's brilliant. When we draw it, so we're going to do the same thing, and I'll make them a little wider. Ooh, sorry, we'll try to make them go straight because we know that's what they're going to do. So here they go. Ooh. Apparently, they also like to do all sorts of things, and we get our rare refraction. Now, in class, if you're ever asked to draw a wave, please make sure all your lines are the same length. It's a little harder for me, but you make sure all your lines are the same length, because actually what I'm showing you is that for some reason my slinky got wider or fatter along the way, which we know can't happen. Okay, and then they get wide again, and then they get thin again, but the point is this is my rare refraction, okay? widest part. So we have two important parts. How does that help us though? Because now we know they come close together, they get far apart. But you know, in terms of describing waves, when we looked at transverse waves, 
we never really considered what the amplitude of the wave meant for us or what the distance between the rest position and the crest meant. It didn't make much sense. And in fact, in our calculations, we never even considered amplitude, which means finding the wavelength of the wave is really important. Now, things get a little sticky with a longitudinal wave because if we're looking at my diagram in particular, which isn't great, you're probably going, oh, wow, where do we find wavelength? First of all, we need to go back to why, how we defined wavelength as a transverse wave, because that's really important. Remember, wavelength is the distance let's do this, between two consecutive points in phase. OK. Great, and here we have a really nice representation of a slinky spring. And essentially what we've done, because it's much easier to identify it, is we're taking the wavelength as from the beginning of one compression to the beginning of another compression. Because then it's quite easy to see that those particles, if they've just gone through the compression phase, are now going to come out into the, into the refraction phase. So beginning of a re-refraction, sorry, beginning of a compression two points in phase. So there's lots of wavelengths and it doesn't actually matter, but it's sometimes difficult to see. So let's go back to the animation we were looking at for our points in phase. Okay, let's go back to the animation I showed you earlier and now we're going to look. Now as you watch this animation, I want you to take very careful note of the yellow particles, okay, because they are very, very special and I want you to watch the yellow particles as they move. So we're going to quickly watch the animation and we go, we watch the yellow particles, it has moved and now can you see as you watch this, and we'll do it slowly, the yellow particles are quite close to the side, they're both moving sideways, they're now going past the, sorry, to the right, they've gone past the equilibrium position and then they're going back and they're going to go left and we're going to keep on, we're not going to worry about the compression at the moment, but the point is with those yellow, did you notice that they were both going backwards and forwards and backwards and forwards at the same time? They were in phase. In the, that, in those yellow particles with any of the white particles would have been out of phase, so we can't use those as wavelengths. But the yellow particles, absolutely that's where the wavelength is. So that's where we get the wavelength from, which is really important for us, because wavelength is what we're going to use for calculations. Excellent. You're going, okay, this, this makes sense. Okay. Now, what about amplitude? We've spoken about amplitude a little bit, but let's define it. Amplitude is your maximum displacement from equilibrium. Longitudinal waves have a little bit of a little added thing here. It says this would be the maximum increase or decrease in pressure from the equilibrium position. Why are we talking about pressure? Because when you were watching the, video, the animations, you noticed that the particles move close together, far apart. They moving close together like that causes pressure, just like you learnt in gases and all sorts of things along the way in science. So that causes pressure. So either we're going to have a big pressure or we're going to have a little pressure when they move far apart. That's why we have to put it in there because it's what happens when the wave when the wave moves when the energy moves. It's an increase in pressure from to the particle in front of it. So the pressure increases, gets transferred, then it decreases, then it transfers to something else. So our amplitude is not just maximum displacement, but maximum increase in pressure from equilibrium, and that causes a compression. So if we increase the pressure, we get a compression. If we decrease the pressure, we get a rare refraction. Okay? Amplitude is going to be quite important when we look at sound waves, which we're going to do a little later on today. But we're talking about waves. OK, longitudinal waves have wavelength, amplitude, but they're a wave. So surely they have period and frequency. Absolutely. Same as what we learned with transverse waves. So longitudinal waves, the period is the time taken, time, one wave. Nothing difficult about that. Frequency is the number of wavelengths per second. Wow. And look here. Frequency equals 1 over frequency. 
maybe not, frequency equals 1 over period, period equals 1 over frequency. Same as what you've done before. Remember, period is a time, so period is measured in seconds, okay? And it's on the board, but it's okay, I'm just reminding you, seconds. Frequency in hertz means per second. Those haven't changed. Wow. All the same things we had when it came to our longitudinal waves. That brings us to having to do calculations. And I think your little brains have had lots of information put in the, into them. So what we're going to do is I'm going to give you a short break. Go get a glass of water. Make sure you've got a pen and paper and a calculator. And when you get back in a couple of minutes, we're going to do some calculations with longitudinal waves. Okay? So we'll see you in a couple of minutes. Thank <laughs> you.